Hi everybody and welcome to the lecture that will cover both chapter 15, Microbial Mechanisms of Pathogenicity, as well as chapter 16, Disease and Epidemiology. These two chapters are related to each other and so that's why we're covering them both together in the same lecture. And we'll start with chapter 15, Microbial Mechanisms of Pathogenicity, which is a bit of a mouthful of a chapter. And so we're going to start by defining some terms that will help us understand what this chapter's title is all about. Pathogenicity is defined as the ability of a microbe to cause disease by overcoming the host's defenses. Within that definition, we see that the term disease is used. And disease is defined as any condition in which the normal structure or functions of the body are damaged or impaired. Another term that will be important for our discussion is virulence, which is the degree to which an organism is pathogenic, or in other words, its disease-causing ability. Not all organisms are equally pathogenic or virulent. For example, Ebola virus has a very high virulence, or something like the yeast Candida albicans has a low virulence. So knowing these definitions, what the title of this chapter really means, Microbial Mechanisms of Pathogenicity, it basically means the mechanisms or the ways that microbes overcome our defenses and cause disease. Now, our discussion is going to cover infectious diseases broadly, but before we move forward, we want to point out a few different special types of infectious diseases and define what they mean. One of those types is a nosocomial infection, also sometimes referred to as a hospital-acquired infection, because a nosocomial infection is defined as an infection that is acquired in a hospital setting. For example, C. diff, the diarrheal disease, is considered to be a nosocomial infection. Iatrogenic infections are infections that occur as the result of a medical procedure. This can be anything from a rash that occurs as a result of taking a particular medicine or an infection of a surgical site after a procedure. Opportunistic infections are infections that occur when the host's normal immune system defenses have been compromised. For example, a vaginal yeast infection would be a cons uh, considered an opportunistic infection if it arises after broad-spectrum treatment with antibiotics which leaves the vaginal canal devoid of bacteria that are able to compete with the yeast that are normally found in that area, and therefore the yeast are able to take the opportunity to proliferate. Zoonotic diseases are infectious diseases that are transmitted from an animal to a human. For example, the avian flu, which is also called the bird flu, is an example of a zoonotic disease that normally circulates within the bird population, but has been known to be contracted by humans from direct contact with birds. As we move forward in the rest of the semester, we are going to be talking a lot about infectious diseases of the various body systems. In fact, our final two units are going to consist of this discussion exclusively. And so the language of disease that we're going to be using consists of two different words that are related but distinct from each other. Symptoms and signs. So symptoms are defined as subjective changes to body function resulting from disease. These are things that can be felt and experienced, but cannot necessarily be measured and quantified. For example, pain, nausea, and malaise are all examples of symptoms that can be experienced, whereas signs are objective changes to body function that can be observed and measured outwardly by a clinician. So when you think of signs versus symptoms, think of the phrase vital signs, which refers to things that can be measured. For example, body temperature is a vital sign. A rash would also be a sign because it's something that can be objectively observed and measured, as well as stool consistency. When we look at the progression of an infection from its initiation to its end, there are a few different stages of development that are identified and that most diseases will run through as they move through their course. The incubation period is the very first of these stages, which occurs in between the initial infection and the appearance of signs and symptoms. 
So it's the time between when a person first acquires a microorganism and when they first display the outward signals that they have an infection. Next is the prodromal period. This is a short interval after the incubation period wherein early mild symptoms start to be experienced. So um, the prodromal period is something that does not come with all diseases because sometimes the prodromal period is so short that it is poorly defined. However, for something like the common cold, for example, if you feel a sore throat coming on before you've experienced the full-blown effects of, for example, a fever, runny nose, etc., that initial sore throat might be considered part of the prodromal period. Next comes the period of illness, which is the time in which the symptoms are most severe and the signs are overt and outwardly visible. The period of illness um, can last varying amounts of time, but once a person's immune system overcomes the period of illness, then the illness enters the period of decline, which is during uh, the time during which the signs and symptoms of the disease subside. Lastly, the fifth and final stage is called the period of convalescence, and this is the period where the body recovers and returns to its normal function. So to review these foundations that we've just laid about disease, we're going to do our first checkpoint here. Individuals with severe sepsis experience a sharp drop in blood pressure known as shock. Is this drop in blood pressure a sign or a symptom of sepsis? So now that we've covered some basics about disease, we are going to move on to the bulk of this chapter 15 lecture, which is where we discuss how pathogens go about causing disease, or in other words, the microbial mechanisms of pathogenicity. From the pathogen's perspective, there are a few different stages by which it causes the disease. The first is adhesion, where the microbe is introduced to the body. Then there is invasion, where the microbe spreads. Infection, where it proliferates. And finally, transmission, where it exits the host and moves to other hosts to restart this whole process over again. So we're going to take a look at these steps from the microbes perspective and we're going to uh, talk about what happens in each for the different categories of microorganisms, for example, bacteria, viruses, protozoans, etc. And we're going to pay special attention to virulence factors, which are traits or characteristics that make these different types of organisms better able to cause disease at each of these different steps in the process. So we're going to start with adhesion. It should make sense to us that the first step of a microbe initiating an infection is for it to attach to its host. Once it finds a host, it will attach to the host in order to gain entry at one of a variety of what are called portals of entry, using special molecules found on the surface called adhesins. Here we can see a cartoon depiction of some surface adhesins on the bacterial cell wall, which are attaching to a host cell here at these adhesin receptors. These interactions can happen, as we said, at any of the variety of portals of entry, which can include the mucous membranes, which are mucus secreting tissues that line the various body systems, including your respiratory tract, your gastrointestinal tract, your genitourinary tract, and your conjunctiva. So any of these surfaces of the body contain mucous membranes, and that is one possible entry point for certain organisms. Other portals of entry include skin. There are natural openings in the skin, ranging from hair follicles to sweat glands to sebaceous or oil glands, which some microbes can use and take advantage of as a way to gain access to the body. Some microbes can also penetrate the skin, even in the absence of natural openings. For example, hookworm is a worm that can burrow through the surface of the skin, even if there is a lack of natural openings for it to go into. Other microbes infect the skin itself, 
So for some microbes, they infect um, the, the surface of the skin. They don't necessarily need to gain access deep into the body in order to initiate infection. Uh, hook, uh, not hookworm, ra uh, ringworm is an example of one of these. If you've ever seen a ringworm infection, a little red spot on the surface of the skin, that is infection of the skin itself. There's also the parenteral root. Parenteral root sounds like it might be part of the skin portal of entry, but it is considered a separate portal of entry because this describes microbes that enter through breaches of the skin or mucous membranes. So for example, through cuts or uh, scrapes or stabs, anything that breaches the skin or mucous membrane is considered a parenteral root. Now some pathogens may have a preferred portal of entry, meaning if they enter the body through this portal, they are capable of causing diseases. But if they enter through other portals, they may not be able to cause disease. For example, Streptococcus pneumoniae is an organism that can cause diseases when it uh, enters the body through the mucous membranes of the respiratory tract, but it is harmless in the gastrointestinal tract. Another example is E. coli. E. coli is one of the more common causes of urinary tract infections. However, it is typically harmless when found in the gastrointestinal tract. So through some portals of entry, microbes may be pathogenic, and through others, they may be harmless. Now, many microbes may possess special virulence factors that make them better able to adhere to a host and conduct this initial first stage of infection. And we'll look at these in terms of the different categories of microbes here. Bacteria may possess adhesins on their cell walls or extracellular appendages that are able to interact with and stick to host cells. A specific example is type 1 fimbriae that are found on enterotoxigenic E. coli cells. You may remember that fimbriae are surface extracellular appendages that are used for attachment purposes. Enterotoxigenic E. coli is a specific mutant strain of E. coli that is able to cause gastrointestinal infection. And these type 1 fimbriae allow these E. coli to attach to the intestinal epithelial cells and therefore cause disease. So this strain of E. coli is a common cause of traveler's diarrhea, and its ability to do so is enhanced by the presence of this virulence factor. Viruses, as we've talked about before, have protein spikes. For example, the influenza virus has a specific type of spike called the H spike, which stands for hemagglutinin, and these spikes interact with the surface of cells found in the respiratory system and convince them to gain entry to the cell where they can cause infection. Protozoa may have unique attachment mechanisms for adhering to their hosts. For example, we talked about how the uh, protozoan parasite Giardia has a sucker disc, which it uses to attach to the intestinal wall. Helminths, or parasitic worms, also can exhibit unique attachment mechanisms. For example, the nematode hookworm has special hooks that allow it to attach to its host, which you can see in this microscopic image right here. This brings us to another checkpoint, Clostridium tetani, the pathogen that causes tetanus, can only enter the body through deep wounds in the skin or mucous membranes. How would we describe its preferred portal of entry? Step two in the pathogenesis of an infectious disease is invasion. So once attachment and adhesion has taken place and the microbe gains access to the body, invasion describes how that microbe may spread throughout the tissues or body systems. Now, this includes both um, the ability of the microbe to spread throughout the body, but also simultaneously avoid destruction by the host's immune system. That too is wrapped up in this step of invasion. So there are many virulence factors that microorganisms may possess that enhance their ability to invade the body. And once again, we're going to look at these by breaking them out into category based upon the type of microbe that we're looking at. Bacteria 
may possess capsules, which, as we've talked about before, are a form of glycocalyx, which provides additional protection outside of the cell wall of the bacterium. Streptococcus pneumoniae is one such example that produces a protective capsule, which allows these bacteria to better resist destruction by the white blood cells of our immune system. Bacteria may also produce exoenzymes and or endotoxins and exotoxins. And these two virulence factors warrant a little bit more discussion, so we're going to address them on separate slides here. Exoenzymes are special enzymes that bacteria can produce and excrete outside of the cell. So this is why they are called exoenzymes. They're made inside the bacterial cell, and then they are excreted out of the cell. Some examples of exoenzymes that are considered virulence factors in disease processes include collagenase. Collagenase is an enzyme named for what it breaks down, which is collagen. Collagen is an important connective tissue, and the ability of a bacterium to secrete enzymes that break down connective tissue increases its ability to spread the infection throughout the body. Another example is the enzyme phospholipase C. This enzyme is produced by Bacillus anthracis, which is the cause of the disease anthrax, and this enzyme allows the Bacillus anthracis cells to escape white blood cells, which have engulfed them, before they can be effectively destroyed, which is what is shown in this drawing right here, is a bacterium being engulfed, but the phospholipase is able to allow that bacterium to escape before it can be destroyed by the immune system cells. Urease is another example of an enzyme. Urease allows the bacterium Helicobacter pylori to neutralize stomach acid and then penetrate the lining of the stomach where it can go on to cause ulcers. So these are just a few examples of exoenzymes that increase the abilities of specific bacteria to cause diseases. In addition to exoenzymes, bacteria may produce toxins, which are defined as biological poisons that improve a pathogen's ability to invade the host and cause damage. Toxins are divided into two different subcategories. There are endotoxins and exotoxins. Endotoxins are lipopolysaccharides that are found in the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. Hopefully you recall that gram-negative bacteria have a cell wall structure that consists of a thin layer of peptidoglycan that is sandwiched between two membranes, and that the outer membrane contains lipopolysaccharides that are toxic to host cells. Now these endotoxins are released when the cells divide or die, because these are times when that outer membrane material sort of comes loose and um, is, is turned loose in the body of the host. Endotoxins are known for producing general inflammation, including fever, and we can contrast them to exotoxins. Exotoxins are produced mostly, but not entirely, by gram-positive bacteria rather than gram-negative bacteria. They are made of protein, and they are produced as a part of the organism's metabolism rather than being an inherent part of their structure, like the lipopolysaccharide in gram-negative bacteria. And whereas endotoxins produce general inflammation, exotoxins are capable of exacting specific types of damage to host cells. So when we say specific types of damage, let's take a look at some examples of exotoxins and the type of damage that they generate. Cholera toxin is produced by the species Vibrio cholerae, and the specific way that it damages the host is it leads to massive secretion of fluids and electrolytes from intestinal cells, which leads to the rice water diarrhea that is characteristic of the disease cholera. Tetanus toxin is produced by Clostridium tetani, and this toxin inhibits neurotransmitters and leads to paralysis. Streptolysin is an exotoxin found in Streptococcus pneumoniae, and this disrupts the membranes of host cells by creating pores in them. 
So as you can see, rather than just causing a general inflammatory response like endotoxins do, exotoxins produce very specific types of damage to the cells that they are affecting. Now that we've talked about some of the major virulence factors found in bacteria, we'll move on to discussing the virulence factors that are found in viruses, which mainly includes antigenic variation. We'll talk about what antigenic variation is in just a moment, but it makes sense to mention first that this is a phenomenon that we see in influenza virus. The protein spikes of influenza virus are constantly mutating. Antigenic variation describes the way in which viruses can change their antigens or surface proteins. And this prevents the host cell's immune system from retaining a permanent memory of what the virus looks like because it's always changing. A virus might start out with a certain variant of a protein, and over time it may mutate to present a different one, such that by the time the immune system catches up to recognizing variant 1, the virus is already presenting variant 2. And this process goes on continuously. It is the reason why a seasonal flu vaccine is required rather than simply being able to get a single flu vaccine that covers all possible flu variants. Antigenic variation explains why we need to continually update our vaccine to better match the variants of the flu virus that are being produced through antigenic variation. So now we have a third checkpoint. Neisseria meningitidis is a gram-negative species of bacteria, and it is the most common cause of bacterial meningitis in adults. Its toxin, known as lipooligosaccharide, is embedded in the outer cell membrane. Is this an endotoxin or an exotoxin? One more checkpoint on these topics. How would the approach to preventing measles have to change if the measles virus exhibited antigenic variation. Moving on from viruses, fungal pathogens also exhibit virulence factors. They can produce toxins that are called mycotoxins, the prefix myco meaning fungus. For example, the fungus Aspergillus flavus produces a, a toxin called aflatoxin, which is mutagenic and can potentially damage the DNA of people who become infected with it or become exposed to it. Fungi can also, in certain cases, produce capsules, although this is a rare virulence factor, only exhibited by members of the genus Cryptococcus. The protective capsule, like a capsule found in a bacterial cell, allows the fungi to evade the immune system, and as a result, Cryptococcus is the only genus of fungi that is able to cause the uh, brain inflammatory disease meningitis. Protozoa also exhibit virulence factors, including antigenic variation, just like viruses do. Plasmodium falciparum, which is the cause of um, the most virulent form of malaria, changes one of the important surface proteins over time, which makes it difficult to protect against. They also can produce capsules, Trypanosoma perucii, which is the cause of um, Afri African trypanosomiasis, or also known as African sleeping sickness, produces a protective capsule similar to fungi, similar to bacterial cells. Helminths, parasitic worms, exhibit some virulence factors, um, but the one that we want to mention that is different from any that we've seen so far is immune system suppression. For example, Schistosoma masoni destroys the antibodies that host organisms can produce using special enzymes, and in this way are able to suppress the immune response which would normally destroy the parasite. After a successful invasion takes place, then the disease is at the stage where it's recognized as an infection. So infection results from successful invasion and replication, or in other words, multiplication of the pathogen. Infections can vary in the extent to which they affect an organism. A local infection is an infection wherein the pathogen is limited to a small area of the body and not found in other areas of the body. For example, toenail fungus is an example of a local infection. 
that only impacts one area of the body. A systemic infection is an infection wherein the pathogen or its products, such as toxins, are spread throughout the body by the circulatory system or the lymphatic system. Chickenpox is an example of a systemic infection. It enters through the respiratory system, but then it spreads throughout the body, leading to the characteristic rash on the skin that chickenpox is known for. Step four is the final step in the process of uh, pathogenesis of a disease, and this is called transmission. This is where the pathogen leaves the body through portals of exit. Portals of exit can include some of the similar portals uh, to the portals of entry. For example, the respiratory system is a portal of exit. Some pathogens are able to leave the respiratory system through coughing, sneezing, or talking. Gastrointestinal is also a possible portal of exit. Feces or saliva are able to transmit certain diseases. Genitourinary secretions. And uh, skin as well, including drainage from wounds or puncture bites or puncture marks, including insect bites. Some diseases, as we will see in chapter 16, are transmitted by insects, and those insect bites are technically a portal of exit. So this concludes our discussion of chapter 15, and now we're ready to move on to chapter 16, which is entitled Disease and Epidemiology. We've talked about what disease is in chapter 15, but we haven't yet defined epidemiology. Epidemiology is the science that studies disease from a population perspective. Epidemiology looks at a few different aspects of disease, including the etiology, or the cause of the disease, the geographical distribution of the disease, the timing of its occurrence, and its transmission. So we're going to be talking about how epidemiologists classify diseases in terms of these different aspects of them. One way in which diseases are classified is based on their communicability. Some diseases are considered non-communicable, meaning although they are infectious, they cannot be transmitted between hosts. An example of this is tetanus. Tetanus is a disease that can be caught when the bacterium that causes it enters through a puncture wound. However, it cannot be caught between people. In other, in other words, it can't be transmitted between hosts. This is contrasted to communicable diseases, which can be transmitted between hosts. And a special subset of communicable diseases are contagious diseases. Contagious diseases are ones that can be transmitted rapidly and easily between hosts. So they are communicable diseases that can be transmitted very efficiently. When epidemiologists talk about the occurrence of a disease, one of the things they are concerned with is the morbidity rate, which is the frequency of occurrence of a particular disease in a population. And there are two different numbers that matter when we're talking about morbidity rate. There's the incidence and the prevalence. Incidence is the number of people who contract a disease during a particular time period whereas prevalence is the number of people affected by a disease during a particular time. We can think about incidence as the number of new cases, whereas prevalence is the number of ongoing cases. It makes most sense to distinguish these quantities from each other in diseases that affect people long term. For example, hepatitis C, HIV, or malaria. However, in diseases that affect people over a shorter period of time, for example, influenza, it doesn't make sense to distinguish these two numbers from each other quite as much because uh, they often track quite closely with each other. Another quantity that epidemiologists are concerned with with regard to occurrence of a disease is the mortality rate. Mortality is death as a result of a disease. And so the mortality rate is the frequency of death from a particular disease in a population. In this checkpoint, we're going to look at some statistics about malaria infection. In 2018, malaria was contracted by 1 million individuals worldwide, which brought the total number of cases of malaria up to 229 million active ongoing cases. 
So what was the incidence and what was the prevalence of malaria at the end of 2018? Based on the occurrence rates of diseases, epidemiologists will classify them based on a, a particular pattern of incidence that they fall into. Sporadic diseases exhibit a pattern of incidence where they occur only occasionally in a region. For example, plague is a disease that is still around because it is carried by rodents, but it is not common to see it anymore. Uh, and so when small pockets of plague cases pop up, they are considered sporadic. Endemic diseases are diseases that are constantly present in a particular region. This is usually because they are carried by uh, a certain animal or an insect vector that transmits them, or they are present in a reservoir uh, like water. Malaria is an example of a disease that is endemic in sub-Saharan Africa. An epidemic is a disease that is present in a larger number of people than expected in a particular region. For example, when you refer to uh, an epidemic of Ebola in, for example, the Democratic Republic of Congo, which has occurred um, several times, this is referring to a massive outbreak of Ebola that affects a larger number of people than would uh, be expected to be impacted in a particular time period. A pandemic is an epidemic that occurs on a worldwide scale. An example, of course, is COVID-19. So this is where a larger number of people than expected are affected by a disease, but the extent of that uh, impact is felt rather than just one region all over the world. Now, one question I get sometimes is what is the difference between just normal seasonal variation versus epidemics? For example, uh, there's a large number of influenza cases that happen during the winter season, but we still don't usually consider this an epidemic. And yes, that's true. Epidemiologists have a normal rate of case fluctuation that they have expected and established, and they also have a threshold called the epidemic threshold, where if case numbers exceed that normal rate by this much, then suddenly it is considered an epidemic rather than normal seasonal variation. So we can see right here, uh, this is deaths due to the flu and pneumonia, and we can see how in 2008, there was a massive uh, outbreak of cases of flu and pneumonia that exceeded the epidemic threshold and went far beyond the seasonal variation that is expected. And this is why the influenza season in 2007-2008 was considered an epidemic. Another important way of classifying and talking about diseases is their severity. Acute diseases are diseases that develop rapidly but last a short period of time, such as influenza. Chronic diseases are diseases that develop slowly and are less severe, but they last a long period of time, like hepatitis B. Subacute diseases are a rare type, uh, a rare classification of disease that develop at a medium rate and to medium severity. So this is somewhere in between acute and chronic. It's not very often that you see diseases classified as subacute, but one example is subacute endocarditis, which is a form of um, infection of the endo endocardium of the heart, uh, which develops to a medium severity and uh, at a medium rate. A latent infection is an infection where the causative agent produces the disease after a period of inactivity. For example, cold sores uh, are at various stages a latent infection, the disease-causing agent, which is a herpes virus, is ever-present in the body. However, uh, at most periods of time, it is not active, and therefore the disease is not apparent. This brings us to a few checkpoints concerning these classification schemes. In 2019 and 2020, the Democratic Republic of Congo reported a measles outbreak of 350,000 cases and 6,500 deaths. How would the pattern of incidence of measles be described in this situation? Next, shingles may occur in individuals who have previously been affected by chickenpox when it, the etiologic agent, which is the varicella virus, 
lies inactive in the spine for many years. During this time of inactivity, how would you classify the severity of the disease? So as we mentioned before, diseases that are endemic to a region may be endemic or constantly present because they are held in some sort of a reservoir. The source that harbors a disease is defined as a reservoir, and reservoirs can be either living or non-living. Examples of living reservoirs include humans. Humans can be uh, sources that harbor a disease regardless of whether they are affected or whether they are a carrier. Wild and domestic animals can also be reservoirs for diseases. For example, as we mentioned, plague is carried by rodents, and so they are considered a living reservoir of the plague. Non-living reservoirs can include the soil. For example, the bacterium that causes botulism is a soil bacterium. And uh, water can also be a reservoir. For example, poliovirus can be transmitted through water um, especially when that water is contaminated with sources of sewage. Lastly, we want to talk about types of disease transmission, which is also something that epidemiologists are concerned with because this describes the way in which diseases jump from person to person. There are a few broad categories of transmission, one of which is contact transmission. Within contact transmission as a broad category, there are some subtypes of contact transmission. Direct contact transmission describes a situation where the pathogen is transmitted through direct physical contact between two hosts. In other words, no physical intermediate object is used. A special subtype of direct contact transmission is called vertical direct contact transmission, which refers to when a pathogen is transmitted from mother to fetus during pregnancy or birth. For example, neonatal HIV can be transmitted to a fetus if a mother is infected with HIV. Indirect contact transmission is also considered a type of contact transmission, but this form involves an intermediate object called a fomite. So it's a non-living object that the pathogen will attach to, and then that object can serve as a manner through which the pathogen can be transmitted to another person, for example, through a doorknob. Droplet transmission is considered a type of contact transmission as well. And droplet transmission is where a pathogen is spread over a short distance, which has to be less than one meter. This is what distinguishes it from airborne transmission. Droplet transmission is where mucus droplets that are created through coughing, sneezing, talking, etc are passed from person to person over a distance of less than one meter. Vehicle transmission is another broad category of disease transmission. This is where material uh, that is related to a pathogen is passed through some sort of a quote unquote vehicle, which can include uh, air, water, or food. So airborne transmission is where a pathogen is transmitted over distances greater than one meter through dust or fine spray of respiratory expulsions. For example, COVID-19, uh, although originally thought to be only transmitted through droplet transmission, was later recognized to be possibly transmitted through airborne transmission as well, which makes it that much more transmissible. Waterborne transmission is where a pathogen is transmitted through water, usually water that has been contaminated with sewage. As we mentioned, polio is an example of a disease where waterborne transmission comes into play. And then finally, foodborne transmission is where a pathogen is transmitted through foods that are not fully cooked, not well refrigerated, or otherwise contaminated. For example, typhoid fever caused by the bacterium Salmonella typhi can be transmitted in a foodborne manner. An important subtype of foodborne transmission is the fecal oral route, which is where a pathogen is transmitted um, through feces to another vehicle, like food or water, and then to a host. So this particular route, uh, the goal of a lot of food safety procedures, such as washing hands and proper uh, sterilization and heating, is to avoid things like the fecal-oral route from taking place. <laughs>
The last major category of transmission is vector transmission. Vector transmission describes the transmission of a pathogen through animals that carry it from host to host. Most often, the vector is a species of insect. Ticks and mosquitoes are very common insect vectors for human diseases. There are two different forms of vector transmission. Mechanical transmission is where the pathogen, pathogen is transmitted passively through contact with the insect's body parts. For example, if a fly lands on a pile of dog feces, picks up a pathogen and then comes and lands on your hamburger, it could transmit that pathogen to the surface of your food just by virtue of coming into contact with the pathogen and then that pathogen brushing off when it uh, touches your food. Biological transmission is a type of vector transmission where the pathogen is transmitted actively when an insect that is carrying it bites one host and then picks up that pathogen and transfers it to another host. For example, when a mosquito bites a person and transmits malaria that it has picked up from another individual, this is an example of biological transmission. So we're going to finish off our lecture with a few checkpoints here about transmission routes. A patient sick with the flu coughs into a tissue. Their caregiver then picks up the tissue to throw it away and then eats a meal. The caregiver becomes ill with the flu. What type of transmission is exemplified here? And lastly, plague is transmitted from infected rodents to humans through tick bites. What is the reservoir for plague and what type of transmission does it exhibit? And once you're finished with this checkpoint, you're finished with chapters 15 and 16.